What role can new media and the internet play in the history of participatory art? Um, and in what way does it perhaps change the parameters of, of participatory art? That's what we're going to talk about in this session. Um, and we're going to do so through uh, various theoretical positions uh, and various examples from popular culture. And then when we get together, we'll, um, we'll sort of deploy these ideas and have kind of a, a broader context for uh, specific art examples that have to do with the internet, with cyberspace, with um, technological mediation online. So it should be, should be really interesting. Let's start, I think a good place to start is the most, let's say the most recent development um, in popular culture, which also means um, socio socioeconomic developments, obviously. Um, and that would be the, the metaverse um, and the, the planned uh, makeover that Facebook is undergoing, moving from Facebook to a company called Meta and transitioning the idea of being online from posting and writing um, to actually entering into a virtual uh, space, a virtual, virtual reality. And so I didn't know this before. I watched a talk by David Chalmers, who we'll talk about in a second, where he talks about the history of the word metaverse. And it, it was actually coined in 1992 in this science fiction book by Neil St Stephenson um, called Snow Crash. Um, and um, um, Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg, evidently picks up on this word in order to um, uh, describe, in, in order to name the, the sort of the new, the new logic of, of his company. Um, and you see it in the middle there. Uh, this image, I find, I, I don't know, I find it a little, a, a little disturbing in some ways. It seems very bland. Uh, you sort of get this conception of these people, they're online in this sort of cartoonish ideal space um, without any legs, so they're floating around. A very multiracial, a very multiracial um, a group of, of, of avatars um, looking at you and saying hi, giving you a thumbs up. I almost want to read this image psychoanalytically where this is the ego, sort of the front of the store. Um, and then, obviously, uh, the, the superego would be the company itself um, and whatever rules and laws will be put in place for uh, behavior uh, in the metaverse. And then maybe most worrisome would then be the id, um, all those destructive drives underneath uh, this, this glossy front of the store image, um, which almost certainly will be uh, unleashed as we see online um, every day. So, so talking about the metaverse f first is interesting because here we have a planned social space, uh, a, a planned space of community, of, of participation um, that's totally virtual. And so this is what we want to, one of the things we want to talk about today is, is what does this do to sociability, to conviviality, to community, to participation, right? Um, when, when we convene as, as avatars in virtual spaces. If you're interested in this problem, in this question, um, there's a new book out called Reality Plus by David Chalmers. He's a well-known um, philosopher of science who's worked a lot on the history of, of cognition. And his, the central thesis to his book, this new book, is to, is to urge us to think of virtual reality um, as genuine reality, not as something illusory, not something that's less real, that's surreal, uh, but something that's equally real as uh, as everyday as everyday life. Um, and he argues that uh, living on the metaverse or living in virtual reality can be as meaningful as living in uh, in real life. Um, and we're going to talk about these terms in real life, IRL, and the difference between in real life and away from keyboard, which is which is actually quite interesting. Um, so he. Um, um, he, he makes he makes a case that actually this could be a good thing. Now he's not naive. He understands that there are pitfalls here, um, and there are, there are some um, bad eventualities that could come about of living on the um, metaverse. Uh, but I think he thinks, on the whole, that the good and the bad of of everyday life and the good and the bad of, of virtual reality are will more or less um, 
balance out. Um, so if you're interested in this question, uh, go ahead and, and uh, check out his book. It, I think it just came out. Um, so this, this is our, our central question for today. Can, can new medias, can something like the metaverse aid in connection and participation? Um, and what does this mean for uh, contemporary art and contemporary society? As it happens, uh, I was just, you know, I go on The Guardian, uh, one of my news sources, and uh, just uh, almost on the same day or just a few days apart in the month of April, there are two stories that, that came up that had to do with virtual reality. And the first was, um, the first is about a, a documentary that's coming out with the BBC about someone who's gone on to virtual, virtual reality sites online and then uh, just experienced an onslaught of abuse um, um, and, and various forms of, of trauma. Um, mediated by virtual virtual spaces, so that's the one on the left, my nightmare trip into the the metaverse. And yet, um, just a few days before, a story comes out about virtual reality and its ability to help people through in, in therapy, especially people who have agoraphobia. There's another story I could have shown you, one in which doctors are using virtual reality to treat uh, to treat pain. Um, which, which is, is very interesting. So what we have here, I think, with these two stories that are released, that are part of, our, part of the conversation of VR uh, right at the same time, means that we're dealing with um, maybe a coin or a double-edged sword um, or a, a, a poison and cure kind of situation when it comes to new technology, new media, um, the internet, and virtual reality. And so I think it can fairly be described as, as having, there are two positions on this. Uh, one, one position would be technophobic, uh, so positions that are skeptical or uh, refuse uh, technological innovation. Uh, and, and, and the internet and virtual reality um, thinking or arguing that it'll actually be detrimental to, the, to uh, human, human society. The other position then would be more technophilic. Uh, phobic is fear, philic is love. So the more technophilic position is to embrace newer technologies and to see in them new possibilities, even possibilities for uh, new forms of being, of relating, um, and new forms of em emancipation. And so what we're going to do in this session, I'm going to go through some canonical and non maybe not so canonical positions and examples the first set being more technophobic, the second set being technophilic, and then we'll see where where do we land, um, and where do the artists that we're going to be um, uh, looking at when we get together where do they land within this this um, I would say it's a spectrum of phobic and philic positions in relation to uh, techno. We can begin by going back to the Situationist International um, and pay attention, do a close reading of Guy Debord's Society of the Spectacle from 1967 to see a position that I think is safe to say is more on the technophobic side of things. Um, and as, we, as we've seen throughout this semester, uh, the, the, the spectacle and Debord's idea of the spectacle, the Society of the Spectacle, is one of the key reference points for a lot of participatory artists especially those in the 90s and relational aesthetics and so on and so forth. So the idea is that to get people together and to have social relations be the artwork um, is a way of fighting or combating the spectacle, which um, keeps, us, uh, keeps us apart and separates us. So this is the first chapter of Society the Spectacle, of, of separation. Um, so seeing that society the spectacle is such a key touchstone for participatory artists, maybe it's it's a good it's a good idea to go back and to read some of it. We're reading just the first chapter, and to see what De Ball says about the spectacle, um, why it leads to alienation and inauthenticity. But then I think the other thing we want to think about is um, in what ways. Uh, um, does does online living uh, today, which would not be yet a thing in Debord's time, um, how does it complicate his notion of, of the spectacle? Um, this is what we want to think through when we're thinking about 
uh, de Bol's ideas. So let me just go through a few of the, the key passages, um, the key, uh, some of the key theses from Society the Spectacle. The first one has probably one of the most famous quotes in the whole book, where he says that everything that was once lived directly has moved away into a representation. This in many ways is the, the key claim of, of the book, that there was some point where uh, human societies, um, what it meant to be in a community was to live together, to sort of have this unmediated relationship with other people. Uh, but but over the course of the history of capitalism and technology, um, visual culture, media, and representations started to get in between the um, the, the so-called authentic relationships that we used to we used to have. So his um, his idea or his version of, of of the media, and in this in the 1960s here we're talking about advertising and television and film, is one of um, of, of of the loss of authenticity and the, the loss of real existence of, of turning into. Uh, pure representation. So if you've if you've read Baudrillard or if you've seen The Matrix, um, there's a long lineage of this idea that uh, that the the spectacle that um, that um, uh, uh, representation is something that you can fall into um, and be lulled into, and then ultimately separated and live inauthentically. Um, it's a false, a false world, according to to De Boer. The third, the third um, thesis has this important point about uh, how, on the on the on the one hand, it seems like spectacle unifies us. So, like we all watch the same thing. Um, the, the was one of the famous covers for De Boer's book. The first English translation of it you're seeing in the backdrop here of people in the theater watching a 3D film. Um, at first, it seems like it's unifying people. But actually, in that very unification, people are isolated and kept separate. That's another key claim of de Boer, um, that we all enter into sort of a homogenous visual space, uh, but that space actually is a false unification. It actually um, separates us. The fourth thesis, um, I think, is maybe one of the most important ones to really understand what he's doing, especially in this first, this first part, when he says that the spectacle is not a collection of images, uh, but it's a social relation among people mediated by images. So the important thing here, I think, I think we can read this quote in a number of ways, but the important thing to keep in mind here is that the spectacle is not just the images. It's not just advertising. It's not just television. It's not just film. It's the ways in which those visual cues and that sort of like visual verna vernacular of, um, of post-war capitalist European society, that, that, that somehow, uh, even when we're not in the theater, even when we're not watching television or not looking at a magazine, that, that somehow those images are in our heads uh, and they mediate our relations that we have with other people in real, in real life. Um, so there's a way in which the spectacle is a type of social conditioning for, for de Boer, where even the way we relate to other people, the way we fall in love, the way we have sex, the way we have conversations, all of them become more and more mediated by the things we've seen, by the representations of love, of sex, and conversation, right? Um, so this is important to keep in mind with the bow. This is the the spectacle touches everything, even when you're not face to face with with an image, even when you're in society and with other people, IRL. The sixth one uh, is uh, is another important uh, term because this is where he makes clear that the the spectacle is less real um, than the real living than real society. So he says the spectacle is not a supplement to the real world, an additional decoration. It's the heart of the unrealism of the real society. So this is very de Beau. Like it's, he writes in such, it's kind of an opaque, oblique way. And there are a few different ways where we, we can read this. But, but I think it's safe to say that for him, the spectacle and the way in which images and the, sort of the media regime that, that we're in um, uh, makes 
a society less real. There's an unreality to the to to the whole to the whole thing, um, and that actually the spectacle in these media regimes are a negation of life through through the visual. Okay, and I think I've more or less co covered this, but there's an interesting point in the twenty eighth thesis where 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 he he says that um, a technology. Um, that, that underpins the uh, specular capitalism and the society of the spectacle is one that leads to isolation and alienation. Um, so it's a very specific type of, alien, of, of alienation. Um, in, in Marx, if you read the philosophical manuscripts of 1844, they'll talk about alienation in the context of labor, the way in which labor alienates us um, from ourselves and others. Uh, de Bol's thesis in Society of the Spectacle is similar, <clears throat> but for him, the alienation and now because capitalism and labor is so saturated by images, by the spectacle, alienation happens through the visual uh, more than anything else. Um, and in fact, he says at one point that images have become uh, capital. Um, capital has become a, a, in, in, has entered into a specular image um, regime. Okay, so as we know, uh, a lot of the artists that we've studied this, this semester, especially the relational aesthetic artists from the 1990s that uh, Nicola Boyo talks about, they thought that the antidote to this, they, they took the spectacle at face value, and they thought the antidote was to create more authentic situations, artworks where people could come together um, and step outside the spectacle. Um, and these artists, I think... Uh, in, in many ways, I don't think this applies to every case, but I think on the whole, uh, immediate lived situations are better than mediated situations and situations that are mediated by technology, right? So, so this somewhat more technophobic position is very much against, um, against alienation. So now let me get to, uh, let me get to uh, a question that's also on the technophobic side of things, but what if we could envision a world uh, where there was no where there was no alienation, where there was no mediation between people and between minds? This is not something that Debord could have thought about uh, because this is quite new. Uh, but today, it's becoming increasingly possible. Um, although some scientists think that it's it's, it's ultimately not going to be possible, uh, and we don't really know the effects and what it would mean. Um, but what if we what if we could Neuralink as a, as a way of of de alienation of being radically de alienated with other people? Um, and so there's someone like Elon Musk who has a whole company um, where he's working on these questions. Um, supposedly ha has even neuro-linked um, a, a monkey uh, to play a video game so that the monkey only needs to think about what, uh, what should happen on the screen, and it happens. But the ultimate, the ultimate goal for Neuralink uh, is, to, is for us to be able to plug into each other's heads, basically, to, to immediately have access to other people's thoughts um, and other people's emotions and other people's experiences. And so think about it. This is a radical loss of alienation. There would be no alienation between you and someone else. You would become one, uh, one dual but, but uh, um, uh, unified thinking thing between two uh, brains. Um, and here, here's where we get to the idea of singularity and the idea of, of all of us becoming one mind in sort of this transhumanist dream uh, that you may come across in, in some science fiction uh, stories. Um, so someone who's written about this, I think, in interesting ways is Slavoj Žižek, um, most recently in Hegel in a Wired Brain, uh, which just came out last year. And this is a scan from, from my, my copy. Um, and he makes a lot of interesting points about the dream of Neuralink, what it means to be radically de-alienated with other people. Um, and, and, and the consequences of it, uh, socially, culturally, politically. Um, so he makes a really good point here, and, and he actually gives us a diagram. He says that uh, most 
relations with other people, even when it's live, um, there's, there's mediation, there, there's separation. So if you look at the first chart there, uh, he lays it out really clearly. You have your brain, you have your vocal cords, you have the air in which the, the sounds travel, you have uh, the other person's ear, and then their brain, right? So speech is a type of neural link, an analog neural link, uh, but one in which isn't immediately, you know, collapsed into each other. Uh, one in which uh, language, uh, the physicality of space and air mediates, mediates this. Um, in, when it comes to the case of using technology, I mean, it just becomes, it's the same thing, but there's just extra steps of mediation. So like you have the phone that mediates uh, your voice, or you have, um, you have your, uh, your, your, your smartphone or, or your computer um, that mediates your, your writing or your, or your speech. Um, and so this is, this is the way in which we've understood media uh, and the and the the transfer of information from one person to the next. It's always had steps that alienate the, the two, the two uh, the two people or or more than two people, uh, the community um, in communication. But now with the neural link, what happens if you just have you go from brain to brain, right? Um, it's I, I I think what's interesting for us for participatory art. If participatory arts are looking for de-alienated experiences, experiences where um, um, we are we're in direct relationship with other people, then this neural link paradigm uh, of brain to brain is more immediate than any of the analog participatory art relations that we've seen in this class. So I could imagine an artist um, who wants to radically de-alienate people using, if it were possible, of course it's not yet there, but using Neuralink technologies in order to enter into uh, like a, a singularity as, as an art object. So this is really interesting. For Zizek, uh, it's, it's, it poses a lot of problems. Um, there are a number of ways in which um, um, it could lead to uh, complicated questions about uh, the loss of identity, um, the loss of free will, or the complication of free will, um, and uh, political and social abuses. <clears throat> because he likes to point out that if you can send your brain somewhere, then uh, somewhere can send something into your brain. And we're, we're going to talk, we're going to talk about that. Uh, so this new technology, uh, which again isn't yet operative, um, and a lot of scientists think that it probably will never be possible, and we don't quite know what it would, what it would feel like, or what would it, what it would do to our to ourselves, to our brains. Um, uh, the, it raises interesting questions for for participatory art and art that has to do with conviviality and relationality, that that strives more towards a, a de-alienated world. Um, and here's the interesting question is maybe this shows us that alienation is necessary for um, for community, for dialogue um, and for and for politics, uh, because if everything falls into one de-alienated thing, maybe we just become a super organism or something like this. Right. Or a, sing a singularity, which actually might turn out to be the end of politics and the end of sociability uh, and the end of of relationality. Um, um, at all, right? So really, really fascinating ideas. Um, and yeah, probably the most uh, the most worrisome aspect of this, which uh, Zizek talks about in, in, in his chapter in Hegel and the Wired, Wired Brain on Neuralink, um, is the fact that we know, you know, there are ways in which we can manipulate um, neurological activity. And scientists have done it in mice where um, they've been able to hook up and essentially hook up into the, the brain of, of mice, uh, and they've done this now with other animals too, um, other non-human animals, um, and, and they can essentially remote control the, the animal, right? Um, they can send signals into the brain um, that will then, say, turn right, and, and the mouse will turn right. Uh, so it's a, it's a type of behavioral control. Um, and so Zizek and probably all of us would be uh, would be worried about this, right? Because if we do, 
embrace brain, uh, brain implants um, to Neuralink with with our computers, with our homes, with other people, uh, then what's to stop um, the, the ultimate powers that be in, um, in sending us, um, in, in, in turning us into sort of remote control creatures in compatible ways? And Zizek brings up an interesting point. He says, what if for the mouse, and this is where the real nightmare would come in, what if for the mouse, turning right after having been told to turn right, actually the mouse thinks, well, I'm the one who wanted to turn right, where the control is actually totally invisible, where we have the, the illusion of, of free, free will, but in fact we're being, we're being controlled. So I think you can see, this is definitely on the technophobic side of things. It's far more advanced scientifically, technologically, than Debord, simply because, of, of course, this is, these are things that are happening now, um, and it, rain, it, rain, it, it, it raises an interesting counterpoint to theories of alienation because this is radically de-alienating us from the world, from other things, and from people. Uh, but maybe, if we're somewhat more technophobic, maybe that's gonna, that is actually a bad thing. Maybe alienation is, uh, some alienation is key to our identities, uh, uh, to sociability and to um, politics as we, as we know it, right? And so we've gone through a few positions here that, that are more, uh, let's, let's say, skeptical of mediation, skeptical of technology, skeptical of computing and interfacing uh, when it comes to our well-being, when it comes to social relationships, when it comes to politics. But what about some more positive uh, positions? Um, I'm going to give we're going to talk about two different examples of, of more uh, positive conceptions, more technophilic conceptions of conviviality and of, of, of relating. And the first will be human to computer. So I find, I find this to be maybe the most interesting question within the history of participatory art. We've assumed, except maybe for the session where we talked about animals a little bit, non-human animals, we've assumed that participatory art is between uh, is, is between human beings, right? But is it possible with the advent of AI, uh, with advanced technologies of the second half of the 20th century into the 21st, is it possible for computers, for artificial intelligence to be participants within participatory works of art? I find this to be a fascinating question. Um, and so some of these examples I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about uh, implicate a human to computer relationship. Right, which is which may not be, uh, which may not be dystopic, which may not be technophobic, but will be technophilic. And after those examples, then we're going to talk about the the computer, digital interfaces, and, and cyberspace as connecting, uh, as mediating human to human experiences. So the first the first examples are human computer, and the sec second examples are human computer human. And again, more on the technophilic side of things. Uh, maybe even as part of an emancipatory politics, as, as we're going to see. So uh, there's an interesting that hap there's an interesting thing that happens in, in the in in the 60s, uh, from 1964 to 66. So one of the early uh, inventors of of of, um, of artificial intelligence at MIT, Joseph Weizenbaum, um, he's working on artificial intelligence, and at some point he tries to um, he programs a computer. Uh, initially, it's just as a joke, uh, but he programs a computer to uh, type back uh, a, a response by repeating what has been said, and usually uh, putting it in the form of a question. And he was actually inspired by a psychotherapist uh, whose, whose method was exactly this. When he's seeing patients, the patients will talk, and then uh, what he would do would then uh, restate what they've said, but pose it into a, a question, which keeps the ball rolling in in, com in conversation. Um, and so he has his secretary. The secretary is the first to sit down and use it. He says, you know, um, um, try, try using this once he's programmed the computer, and the computer was called Eliza. And she started writing and got so engrossed that she asked Weizenbaum to leave leave the room uh, because it was getting you know more uh, more involved and probably more private and what she says 
is that even though she knew that the computer was not thinking, even though she knew the computer was just a computer and wasn't sentient or self-reflexive or conscious, the emotional connection and the ther uh, uh, therapeutic com connection she made with Eliza was very real um, and, 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 very, and very helpful. So this is, now, this is now really interesting, right? Because at first we might think that interfacing with a computer is this alienating um, dystopic experience. Uh, but in fact, testimonial is that, that uh, uh, it, it was an authentic um, emotional uh, dialogue and, and conversation, one that was actually benefit, be, beneficial for, for, the, for the user. So this is a form of conviviality of, of relationality between a human and a computer that actually leads to beneficial r results. Um, and maybe uh, this is, a, an in, we're going to talk quite a bit about feminism later on, but maybe this is an indictment of of a, a patriarchal society where the secretary maybe is not used to receiving questions or interest in what she says, uh, where she's usually, uh, maybe she's just um, uh, dictated. So she finds more compassion and listening capabilities in a computer than maybe she does in the other people in, in her workplace. Of course, I don't know this, uh, but I find that to be an interesting speculation here. We can, uh, we can fast forward to 2013 and talk about a film I'm sure many of you have seen, Her, uh, with Jacqueline Phoenix and uh, Scarlett jo Johansson, and Scarlett Johansson plays the, the AI um, in, in the film that he falls, that he falls in love with. Uh, and this is my favorite scene in the whole film, where he's outside in some square and he's standing he's sitting in front uh he's he's, he's sit sitting in front of this large screen on in a square and this owl or in slow motion comes after him it's a really gorgeous gorgeous scene um in spike jones's jones's her um and so here we have an example that i think is in direct it's a direct lineage of of, of eliza uh, but but of course that takes it to a whole other level because um the idea is that it's 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 possible that um, that uh, the Scarlett Johansson voice, the, the AI, has passed the Turing test, which is the, the test as to whether or not a computer can pass as a real as a real person. She definitely has passed that test in this in this film so much so that that he uh, decides to have a relationship with her and falls in love with her. Um, so. Uh, on, on the one hand, we might think of this as, as in a technophobic sense, that this has alienated him from real relationships with real flesh and blood other people um, in society. Or we can be technophilic and say, well, it sucks to be in, in, in relationships with real people, and it's much better to be in a relationship with uh, a technological person, an AI, um, who's, who's going to be maybe less judgmental, more faithful, uh, smarter, you know, uh, what have you, right? Who knows? Um, but those two positions seem to uh, be the antagonism points in this film, which, which is one of the reasons it's, it's, it's so interesting. Um, and and uh, fiction follows fact, because uh, just recently I was reading in the New York Times, there was this long story about a man in, in Japan who just married is uh, basically an avatar, uh, an anime avatar. And he says, this is a much more fulfilling relationship than I could ever have with an actual um, uh, flesh and blood, flesh and blood person. Um, and again, we have here, we have sort of the, 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 the technophobic response, would be, which would be, uh, how, you know, this is, this is uh, really unhealthy. This is really dystopic. Uh, this is, this is antisocial and so on and so forth. Uh, but the more technophilic response would be, well, what if this guy really is happier? What if uh, some human beings would actually have a more fulfilling, authentic life if they entered into relationships with artificial beings rather than uh, living, living beings, right? Um, who's, who's to say, really? Um, so this is just another interesting example of, of, of participating in society, participating in social relationships in which one of the participants is not human, but is in fact a uh, machine, uh, is in fact um, ar um, artificial. Um, and we can take it to the furthest degree. We can, we can look at Blade Runner uh, 2049, um, 
the the film made just a few years ago by Denis Villeneuve, who just did Dune, uh, the the film with Ryan Gosling, which is um, uh, something of a follow up to the original Blade Runner by Ridley Scott, which if you've never seen the original Blade Runner, um, definitely definitely see that film, um, and this one's also quite quite good, at least uh, at least I think so. Um, and there's a character in in the in the the film um, that's essentially um, a, a, a female, you know, like a girlfriend or a wife that is an AI, uh, but an AI that's actually a hologram. Um, so she is embodied in some ways through a sort of a, like a holographic technology. And there's this incredible scene where she hires a, um, she hires a, a, another woman to come to the apartment um, so that she can fuse with, with, with this other woman so that she temporarily has a flesh and blood uh, body that then, you know, her and the, and the Ryan Gosling character, uh, who himself, well, I'm not going to spoil anything, um, so that they can have, you know, they can have sex, they can, they can have intimacy. Um, so here, who knows, maybe one day uh, this is a sort of technology that will be offered. Uh, people will be able to uh, buy a holographic partner have uh, have uh, genuine loving relationships with them um, and then uh, can sort of uh, uh, have all sorts of ways in which they, they, they can they can connect and again one can one can find this to be a dystopian nightmare or one could find this to be uh, to have emancipatory potential um, for um, um, for for what it means to have uh, a, a relationship Okay, so uh, let's move on now to human-computer human relations, which in some ways I think probably is the is the most important way of talking about uh, uh, talking about this for the for the history of participatory art, because most online new media projects are going to be about uh, bringing people together or having uh, connections uh, and and relations with other people. Uh, but as mediated by cyberspace, as mediated by online uh, online forums and uh, and technologies, like we started the, at the beginning today, uh, uh, virtual virtual re reality. So uh, the human computer human relationality or forms of participation uh, might they be thought of as forms of emancipatory being and politics? Right. This is this is the this is the crucial the crucial question here. Um, in, 1960, uh, in 1996, uh, there was a guy named John Perry Barlow, who was part of the 1960s counterculture. What's interesting about this, the, the history of the internet um, and the, the history of cyberspace, it's actually one that's connected to the countercultural hippie movements of the 1960s, and especially the, 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 the advent of LSD. And the idea that LSD could could create um, uh, a more just, a more peaceful, and a more creative uh, society. Uh, this was this was like a utopian thinking based on this drug that was very prominent in the in the nineteen sixties. So think of someone like Timothy Leary. If you're interested in this history, I, I really recommend a, a, a documentary film by Adam Curtis called Hypernormalization. It's from two thousand fourteen um, or two thousand sixteen. Um, it's quite good. It goes through a lot of different things, but, but some of the central parts that have to do with the history of the Internet and artificial intelligence are super, are super fascinating, so, so I can recommend that. But John Perry Barlow, he was part of the countercultural revolution of the 60s. He even wrote songs for the Grateful Dead, which you probably, everybody probably knows who the Grateful Dead was. Um, then he, later on, he leads a very interesting life. Um, later on, he starts to get involved with the early, um, with early technology, uh, early um, um, formations of, of, of the Internet. Um, and he almost, uh, not almost, I think his conception of cyberspace is one that, that sort of uh, is similar to LSD, but of course the, the drug here is no longer LSD itself, but it's going online. Um, and the idea that cyberspace can be a more peaceful, a more just, a more creative, um, a less alienated uh, form form of, of living. And he even writes um, in 1996 a declaration of the independence of cyberspace. 
which is an interesting read and you can find it online. It's not very long. Um, it, it's quite interesting. So he makes a case that, that, uh, uh, that being online is an emancipatory or will be an emancipatory, uh, more just um, and, and less alienating world. Now, this idea maybe hasn't aged so well um, because since the advent of social media, we've seen a few things uh, that give us cause for pause of this type of utopian optimism. One, what social media does to our brains neurologically, um, especially young people. It's increasingly looking like it's, it's not a good thing. Um, and then two, there's a way in which the online discourse and online being um, has tended more towards misinformation and more towards um, sort of vituperative, nasty forms of, of, of relating with, with, with each other, um, often anonymously, right? So this, this optimism in cyberspace maybe is a little, not maybe, I think is probably definitely over, overblown. Um, but since we can't go back, since we can't, you know, just uh, become Luddites uh, and, 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 um, and go back to like some pre-technological authentic form of, of society, um, which it seems like de Boer is, is after, um, since we can't go back, maybe the only way that we can, we can deal with this is to actually see the remaining potential of cyberspace, the, the, the remaining potential of mediating technologies, of digital interfaces and online living, um, seeing them as still holding a shred uh, uh, or maybe more than a shred of emancipatory potential. So being clear eyed about the ways in which uh, it's, it's had some negative outcomes, but not just then, you know, leaving it behind or, or staying uninformed about it. Maybe there's a way in which um, parasitically we can use it towards more progressive um, and just ends, right? And so this is where things get very interesting for us. Um, and I'm assuming a lot of the examples that we're going to talk about when we get together will be on this side of things, of trying to find ways in which uh, being technophilic, of embracing technology, of, em of embracing new media, is a way of, of creating a more just world. Um, and so I give, I give examples, because I, I think it's fitting, examples from the, the, the near history of cyber feminism. Um, and one of the touchstone works of, of cyber fe feminism uh, is, is Donna Haraway's manifesto, Cyborg Manifesto, uh, which she writes in 1985. Uh, a, a seminal text, highly recommended. Uh, uh, I highly recommend reading it. Um, it's, it's a really important text um, where I think her overall, pro, uh, her overall program in this, is, is in this text is to rethink socialism and specifically feminist socialism, um, rethinking through technology. So rather than thinking like an eco-feminist, which is more about um, uh, nurturing and care and embracing the natural world um, and de-alienation, um, um, and, 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 and thinking of, of what it means to be uh, uh, a, a woman as, as more on the natural side of things, not, not, not through technological interfaces or the machinic. Um, Haraway's Cyborg Manifesto embraces both non-human animals, uh, are the fact that we're, we're primates, we're, we're animals, um, and also the other, the other side of that coin, embracing the machinic. Um, and, and newer technologies towards progressive politics. So there's a, there's a wonderful quote um, where she says, some of the arrangements of race, sex, and class rooted in high-tech facilitated social relations can make socialist feminism more relevant to effective progressive politics. So the idea that one can use technology, that one can use new media, that one can use computers, um, artificial intelligence, uh, online, online living, that one can... Uh, inhabit it parasitically um, uh, through multiple identities, multiple identifications um, as a form of emancipation is rooted in Haraway's manifesto. Um, in fact, it's kind of like the, 
the, the, the, the very beginnings of, of, of cyber fem feminism. So it's definitely technophilic, um, though it's a clear-eyed technophilia. She understands the, the biopolitical control that technology has over us, um, the, the hetero, heteronormative um, powers and spaces that are, um, that, that are definitely um, offline and online. Um, but she sees the, 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 the she sees potential for going in there and mucking things up um, and reorient, reorienting a technology towards more progressive ends. So the logic here, I think in many ways is is um, uh, fighting fire with fire or using um, using the um, using uh, what formally might 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 be thought of as, uh, as bad forms of alienation towards good forms of, of alienation. And this type of thinking uh, lives on. So if you read the, the, a, a pretty recent book by Legacy Russell called Glitch uh, Feminism, which I just finished reading, um, it's very much, it very much, she very much takes uh, her cue from, uh, um, from, from cyber feminism, from Haraway's manifesto. Um, and she sees, again, I, I think clear-eyed, though if, if you read the book, you, there's always this, this, um, this negotiation that happens between technophobia and technophilia. And sometimes the, the, this text might seem a little overly optimistic, um, but of course that's, that's my own reading of it. But in any case, um, she definitely uh, embraces the potential of online living. Um, as, as specifically for uh, um, uh, updating feminism um, uh, and, and, and queer, existen queer existence and, 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 and being transgender um, as a space that can be, put, uh, that can be emancipatory. Um, and there are a few things that she says in, in, in this book. So the glitch itself uh, is really multivalent. It means a lot of different things in the text, but I think on the whole, the glitch is the thing in the system that interrupts the system. Um, and uh, she identifies with the glitch and, you know, what she calls non-normative or uh, people that are uh, deemed to be not normal um, embody or are the glitch. Um, that can lead towards um, em eman emancipation. Um, there's also uh, an interesting, one of the things I found the, the most interesting in, in this text is the idea of uh, uh, playing with, with identity. Um, the glitch is the thing that can't be uh, categorized. It's the thing that interrupts categorization. So obviously the big, the big form, the big binary that, that, um, that, that she goes after is the binary of male, female, uh, the gender binary, but not only the, the that gender bi binary, she even says at one point, um, all the different ways um, that, that one can identify, uh, can sort of um, uh, uh, identify in, in, uh, beyond, beyond the simple binary, that's still captured by taxonomy, that's still captured by categorization. Uh, so there's something about the glitch that's, that's living free of those forms of categorization. If you read this book, there's, very, there's, there's a real emphasis on online and technological freedom. There's a way in which uh, it, it, it's, it's freeing um, for uh, assuming one's identity, uh, but also for assuming multiple identities, right? Not having to be one thing uh, can, be, can be emancipatory. Um, and then the other thing I found really interesting uh, is is not only the ways in which uh, people can sort of realize themselves online in the way that they might not be able to realize themselves in uh, in 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 in, re in real life, although she problematized this term this term in real life, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, but but it's the idea that that uh, for some for some people, um, especially people that are heavily discriminated. Uh, that, that being online is then a form of safely expressing uh, oneself, um, of, 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 of having a safer um, uh, spaces of conviviality and, and connection, right? So I find that, I find that definitely um, compelling. And maybe one of her most important points 
is the idea, and this is the second quote that I've, that I've put up here. And she says, IRL in real life falters in its skewed assumption that constructions of online identities are latent, closeted and fantasy oriented, uh, for example, not real, rather than explicit, bristling with potential and very capable of living on away from the space of cyberspace. So she does, she, she frowns on this distinction between being online and being in real life. She prefers away from keyboard, um, AFK, um, as a way of emphasizing the way in which there's a porosity, uh, that there's, there's uh, endless connections between online existence and offline existence, and that there's a fluid loop between the two. Um, and there, I think, is the most concrete place where, um, where sort of the emancipatory politics that can unfold online could spill over into um, uh, the, the offline world, right? So she doesn't like in real life because it seems to um, have connotations of online being less real. Getting back to, Ch to David Chalmers, idea from the beginning of today uh, she prefers away from keyboard and so if you think about it this is in many ways like the bell spectacle where the spectacle is there even when you're not looking at images even when you're not in the movie theater in front of your television but rather than thinking of that as uh, as bad alienation as mediation that's alienating and, and separating um, it's a it's a good form of alienation it's a necessary form of alienation uh, for Legacy Russell and for, for glitch feminism because it's a way of conjoining, it's a way of connecting. Um, you're alienating yourself through an online interface in order to then make connections that you otherwise wouldn't be able to make uh, and then those connections can spill out into uh, the offline world, right? So I think that's, um, that's um, uh, sort of the, the abstract of, of this book. Um, and she gives a lot of examples of, of new media and online art um, artists and artworks, a lot of them having to do with uh, trans transgender rights, with, with uh, queerness, um, and, and with um, a, a form of feminism that refuses uh, gender categorization. Uh, so I, 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 can, um, I can recommend uh, reading this if you're interested. And this leads us to... Um, the sort of the counter-posing reading that I've given for you um, uh, in relation to De Bell's Society of the Spectacle, the first chapter of Society of the Spectacle, and that is the Xeno-Feminist uh, Manifesto, which, in, in, I've, I mean, I think I've set this up for you nicely. Um, unlike De Bell, which is against alienation, um, whatever that might mean, um, Xeno-Feminism is, uh, is for alienation, for more alienation, um, as a way of um, as a way of of moving towards more progressive feminist uh, uh, society and, and politics, so uh, it's an interesting. It's definitely an interesting manifesto. Um, um, we'll talk more about it when we get together and we talk about our our, our examples. Um, but for xenofeminism, alienation can generate new new worlds. So by alienation here, I mean you know, um, uh, being hooked into uh, technologies for uh, progressive, progressive ends. Uh, it's pretty intensely post-natural. Um, it, 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 it understands uh, any sort of recourse to the natural, of things being, being natural, um, and therefore like in their right condition um, or uh, n not alienated from themselves and so on and so forth, to be... Uh, actually counter-emancipatory um, because if, 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 if something is, it can be essentially something um, and if it's not that thing, it's, it's sort of uh, corrupted or it's, um, it's not living up to what it should be. Um, that's a form of, that can, that can be seen as a form of coercion um, and categorization. So Zeno, the Zeno position is definitely post-natural. It's against um, any conception of of nature as unchanging, as essential, it's radically non-essentialist, and this non-essentialism for for um, for, for this collective uh, leads to leads to true leads to true freedom. Um, and like Haraway, uh, the Cyborg Manifesto, it's very much 
parasitical and one might say transhumanist. I'm, I'm opening up a big can of worms here by using the word transhumanism and transhumanist. We'll talk about it when, when, when we get together. Um, but there's something parasitical about this using technology, inhabiting it um, to, to reorient it away from, uh, from the present power relations um, that are often predicated on, let's, let's face up to the facts, um, someone like Bell Hooks would, would say uh, a domineering uh, patriarchal capitalist uh, um, society and, and politics, reorienting that towards something that would be more emancipatory, uh, feminist, and, and, and progressive, right? So one of the big ideas in here is the idea that feminism has sort of left technology um, and science uh, left it behind, thinking that that's like a, a male space or, or a space that, that doesn't really have emancipatory potential. They radically want to embrace and reorient our understanding of technology, of science, um, of artificial intelligence, of, of, of being online, and so on and so forth. Um, so using mediation, using alienation for emancipatory politics um, in, contradist in contradistinction to let's say, Du Bois' thesis um, uh, from the Society of the Spectacle.